Good morning, church family. So glad that you're here. I invite you to stand and uh, as we begin with time of prayer, as we worship the Lord this day, we thank you. We want to thank him in Jesus' name. Lord, we praise you. We give glory to you in your name. There's no one like you. And Lord, in the midst of turbulent times and where the world seems to be just in tumult and chaos, you are solid. You are king. You reign and rule over all. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to do a mighty work. I can see what you're doing. Use us to do a mighty work in the lives of people you've placed around us. Help us to just glorify you and point people to you. But this day, Lord, we just give thanks to you. We owe it all to you, Jesus. We praise you in your name. Amen. As we look around at all that we see and all that we experience, and all the beauty of the earth, the glory that God has made, we give him thanks. We give him glory. We worship him. Let's sing together. For the great. 
unshakable hallelujah you have done great things Stand alone. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary, and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he is filled with what is good. Lord, we do give thanks to you. Lord, everything that we have, everything that is good, comes from you. Lord, I thank you that even in challenging times, we have so much to give thanks for. We have so much to be grateful for because it's all about you. And Lord, I just praise you for your goodness to us, for your faithfulness, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's see, today, 11 o'clock, we've got children's ministry going on, youth ministry going on, Sunday school. Uh, tomorrow night, there's going to be a women's fellowship event. Just go to the website and follow the links, and I think that'll be at 630 also, we are going to do a midweek, instead of the Bible study this week, we're going to do a Thanksgiving Eve service. Always my favorite service, and this year we're going to miss out on pie and all those good things together. But, we, you know, I just felt like it was so important that we still get together, even if it's over the Internet and Zoom, to uh, sing a few songs of thanks, but also, more importantly, to just share the things that we're thankful for. It's always an encouraging time, so I hope you'll be a part of that. It'll be 6.30 again. You can just follow the links on the website. Reminder that our leadership offering this month is for Operation Christmas Child, and we want to help provide for, for kids all over the world. Another thing I want to just sort of say and put in your ears is that um, we're going to be starting a, a food drive shortly. You know, if this season this season's been tough on a lot of people. If you're finding it hard to make ends meet or you don't have the things that you need to do some holiday dinners, let Doug and I know we'll, we'll do a food drive and then we'll provide a, a Christmas gift basket for anybody that needs it. And if you have people in your neighborhood or your community that, you know, need help, let us know and we can try to do something there too. And then whatever's left over, we'll put out. Hopefully we're going to have our, we finally got the second box from Croatia this week. And so we hope to have both of those out there and, we want to use that to not only give books and things, but we really want to be able to provide food and things because there's a lot of people in our area that are, that are hurting. So just sort of put that in your mind, and uh, we'll talk more about it next week. Now let's just pray again. Lord, I do thank you for you are good. Lord, as your redeemed people, may we joyfully express our gratitude. May we speak to others about the difference that knowing you makes. Right? ask you would help us to be lights, places of encouragement for other people, whether they be brothers and sisters or people that don't know you yet, Lord, that we would just be an encouragement, that we would be a, a positive of voice in a world of chaos. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I think we could all agree that 2020 has been a tough year. No matter how you look at it, uh, this has been a year that none of us have ever experienced the kind of things we're going through. You think about uh, the ongoing impacts of the pandemic, shelter in place orders, businesses, churches, schools being shut down and then reopened and shut down again. And now we have a curfew. First time I think I've had a curfew and since I was a teenager, kind of interesting. And, uh, and then there's our political scene and plus all the social unrest. I mean, there's... There's just a lot of pain out there. There's a lot of strong emotions. So let me ask you, as the Thanksgiving holiday approaches, do you find yourself filled with gratitude and thanksgiving despite our current situation? You know, are you able to praise God and thank him for all that he is and for all that he's done? You know, if you watch the mainstream news, you get the distinct impression that we have little to hope in or be thankful for. You know, they're reporting that in many parts of our country, Thanksgiving has been canceled and it looks like they're going to try to get rid of Christmas as well. And they would say, well, it's just all these effects and there's this thing and it's just, they use all these things to try to make us think that it, things are really bad and there's just nothing to hope in, nothing to be grateful for. So are they right? Is it really true that 
we don't have anything to be thankful for? Anything to praise God for? You know, it was my observation, probably going back at least 10 years, that before the pandemic, as a society, this idea of being thankful was already a characteristic that was waning in our culture. I mean, no longer did we seem to be thankful for the, the many benefits that we've received and enjoyed. And instead, we constantly heard things like, you know, I have a right, I demand this, I deserve this, you know, me, me, me. It's all this stuff that I should have. And in my opinion, it's only gotten worse in the last eight months. But I am here to tell you this morning that as Christians, we need to be careful that we don't become infected and thus influenced by this trend which is taking place in our society. Or else it may alter and adversely impact our own Christians' lives. Because the truth is, God's people, by definition, should be thankful. We should be people that are constantly overflowing with gratitude, no matter what. And in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul will make it abundantly clear that gratitude should be a defining characteristic of the Christian life. So why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, and let's just see what we can learn. Now, Paul has been talking about the incomparable Christ and how great he is, and then he's talking about all the things that he has done for us and how he's building us up. And then he says in verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And then he gives a warning. I mean, we're not going to study, but read on to verse 8 when you have some time because he'll talk about you know, these very things we're doing to see that no one takes you captive or these philosophies and all these things. In other words, don't let all that stuff that's going on in the world around you steal you, steal your joy. Now turn to Colossians 4, 2. Here Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now here in these verses, it's very obvious that gratitude is and an attitude of thanksgiving should be an integral part of the Christian's life. And not only is it to be an integral part of your life, here, this is very important, it should be something that you want to do, that you rejoice in doing. That it's, you know, it's the, another way to say it is that we really should have a genuine passion to praise the Lord and to give thanks to him. You know, we, we want to seize every opportunity we can find to, to praise him and to recollect all the wonderful and good things that he's done. Now, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 30. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. This is a psalm that, that David wrote. And he says in verse 10, Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You know, so instead of being down and distraught, now he's rejoicing. And then he says, you've loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. That may not make a lot of sense to us, but when you were grieving, when you were mourning, when you were struggling, one of the things you often did was you would put on sackcloth, which is, I'd say it's kind of like a, a rough, coarse burlap bag and rub against your skin and irrit irritate it. But he's saying, you know, you've got to rid of that. He says, that my soul may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Now these verses inform us that we should want to give thanks to God. And look what we have here. David was writing to address the fact that God had done great things for him. And he says, because of your intervention and the changes you've brought to my life, because I was in this sad state of despair and anguish, and kind of characterized by the, the sackcloth, he says, and you turned all of that joy and into, you turned all that into joy and gladness. And so he says, with everything in my being, I will give thanks to you. And notice that last word, forever. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Colossians chapter 2. 
If you think about it, before we knew Jesus, we were in the state that the psalmist describes in Psalm 30. You know, we were trapped in our sin, we were destitute, and in this sad state of despair, headed to an eternal destiny that none of us would want or enjoy. But God intervened through his son, Jesus Christ, and those who have received him have their, as their savior, have had their sins forgiven, and as a result, they can know a peace and a joy that is undescribable, and honestly, it's unexplainable. Now, to use the language of the psalmist, each of us was dressed in sackcloth. You know, we were destitute and lost, and on our own, we could not change our situation. You know, the New Testament is very clear that we were bound in this state with no ability to alter or change our clothing. But Jesus comes and he strips all of that away and he graciously clothes us in his own righteousness. And then he presents us to the Father. And we who were once in a sad and hopeless state now find ourselves in this in an exuberant situation of hope and joy as we come to know Jesus. Therefore, we, like the psalmist, who was inspired by the great things that God had done for him, we too should be inspired and motivated with a desire to be overflowing with gratitude to the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying to us in Colossians chapter 2. And you can see this in verse 6 where he says, as you have received Christ Jesus. In other words, what he's saying is because of that relationship, you have undergone a major transformation and change. You're no longer clothed in sackcloth or in the despair of sin. Instead, you have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you've been set on a path of hope that will be fully realized when the Lord returns. All these beautiful things we've been studying and looking at in, our, in, chap, in Matthew 24 and 25, the future. And Paul says, as you have received him as Lord of your life, you know, continue to walk, into, you know, to move forward in that relationship. You know, continue to enjoy those blessings. Continue to offer yourself to God in praise and with gratitude. Now, in verse 7, Paul lists three things that have occurred and continue to take place for those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, you need to understand, these things are not brought about by, you know, our own effort or ingenuity or intellect or, you know, anything else that we as human beings can do. They occur as a result of God's activity and since they're things that we could not do for ourselves, but they've been done for us by God, we should give him praise. We should want to do that. Now, please note, the first thing that Paul says is you have been firmly rooted in Christ. I love that expression. He says you have been firmly rooted in Christ. And what he wants us to understand is that an event took place in the past, which has current implications. That's what the, 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 ten, the Greek tense tells us here. See, it wasn't something that you experienced some emotional thing and it happened one time and that was it. Instead, this event is continuing to influence the present. That's the idea behind this phrase, you have been firmly rooted in Christ. See, when you receive the Lord as your savior, you are placed in the family of God and rooted in him. Scripture often describes it as we are being adopted into his family, but because I like to garden and plant things and grow things, I really like the, the analogy here. In effect, what he's saying is, there has been a place sort of dug out for you in the family of God. You know, you have been planted in God, which means that you can draw on his strength and you can be nurtured by the rich soil of his life. And see, that is intended to produce a security that can't be shaken. We shouldn't get rocked by the current events. We shouldn't get tossed to and fro by the storms that come our way. We really shouldn't do that. And I want to point out that 
This is a completed state in which we exist. It's not temporal. So sort of let me encapsulate this. What he's saying is at some point in the past, whether it was you know, last week or a month ago or two years ago or 30 years ago, whenever you received Christ as your Savior, I just love this idea, it's like a root went down in, from you into God and that root is secure. So the same implications it had in the past at the time of your coming into a personal relationship with the Lord is still effective and working today. You know, you are rooted in God. And again, that is something that none of us could ever do for ourselves. Now, to take it a step further, in Romans 3.23, Paul makes the point that we couldn't do anything for ourselves. Why? Because he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, what he says there is, we did not have the ability to break the power of sin over us. So what did God do? Well, he sent Jesus. And Jesus came, and he not only broke the power of sin and death, but he gave us this incredible privilege of being rooted in him. And because of that, we can be secure and fixed in a relationship with God that's unchangeable. It's, it's rock solid. If we'll just cling to him, we'll hang on. And again, you couldn't do that for yourself. It is God who has done it. It is God who maintains it. And nothing, Paul said, will say later in Romans 8, nothing can separate you from that rooting. We are fixed in God. And so Paul says, because of that reality, all of God's people should be overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving. When we think about what God has done for us, the sacrifices, the things that he's accomplished, we should always want to be giving him thanks. We should just be overflowing with this gratitude. Now, the second thing that Paul tells us is that we are being built up in Christ. Which means for those who have been rooted in Jesus, there is a continual activity taking place in your life each and every day. Do you know what it is? God is actively working inside of you. He's, the way scripture describes it is he is changing you from glory to glory into the image of his beloved son. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper. This phrase, being built up, comes from the realm of architecture and building. You know, it was used commonly for, you know, you talk about somebody, you know, comes up with a design for a building or something, they draw the blueprint, and then they go out and build it. Let me try and explain it this way. <clears throat> Candace and I have some family members who wanted to build a house up on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. The Olympic Peninsula is one of the most beautiful places. If you look at the state of Washington, that little tip way, way up in the northwest corner, that's the Olympic Peninsula. And the Olympic Forest is just glorious. And so they searched and searched, and they found a, a stunning waterfront lot. And they bought it. And one day, a truck delivered a huge load of lumber, but they didn't have a house. They had a lot with a pile of lumber on it. But in the hands of a skilled craftsman and builder, over time, what was once just a pile of lumber would become a beautiful place to live. That's exactly what this passage is saying to us. We are being built up in Christ. See, remember, there was a time when you and I were basically just a pile of lumber here on this earth. We were not living up to our full potential or destiny. We weren't right with God. But Christ invaded our lives, and we were rooted in him. The connection was made, and now each day, this craftsman of eternity comes into our lives. He comes through his spirit. He comes through his word. He comes through our hurts. And get this, and he comes through the various challenges and circumstances we face. All those things I mentioned at the beginning that our, our world wants to tell us is horrible, 
viruses and staying at home and having to modify our lifestyles, all those circumstances, all those things, God uses those powerfully. And if we kind of continue with this building idea, he comes in and he begins, through those circumstances and the other stuff, he begins to cut and to mold and to shape, building a household of faith in our lives. And he enables us to become what he wants us to be, what he always created us to be. And because of that fact, Paul says that we should be overflowing with gratitude and an attitude of thanksgiving. Now, the third thing Paul shares with us is he says we are being established in the faith. Another phrase I really love, we are being established in the faith. Now, this word that's translated here as established literally means to be sure or firm. And it, and it refers to someone or something that's unshakable. It can't be moved. You know, it's, it's rock salad. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that this word was also used in the legal realm in reference to guaranteeing a contract or a document. When it was used in that way, it meant that thing was fixed. It wasn't going to change. And what Paul is saying is that there is no way our belief in God will not be fulfilled. He's saying our belief is secure, our salvation is secure, our hope is secure, because it is based on the validity of the eternal word of God, who has signed the contract. Actually, to be more biblical, he has signed that covenant with the blood of his own son. That's exactly what we'll be studying next week in Matthew, the importance of the Passover and what it means, and also the new covenant. See, it's, it's fixed because of what God said, but God, the guarantee was the blood of our Savior. And Paul says, knowing that truth should not only result in praise, but in gratitude and thanksgiving to God. If we understand what he's done, we, we, we should not have, there shouldn't really be a time where I know we're going to have some moments, but more often than not, we should be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving because we understand this world isn't our home. The best is yet to come. Everything, all the greatest things are ahead of us. And, and I just would say this to you, that that truth needs to impact your life in positive, tangible ways each and every day. So if, my, if I've done my job this morning, you say, okay, we get it. We're supposed to be people of gratitude and thanksgiving. Then I think the question that we need to ask is, how do we do that? Because I think we could agree that it's one thing to say, that, oh yes, as Christians, we should be people that are overflowing with thanksgiving and gratitude. It's another you know, to actually do it, right? Well, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul tells us that one of the ways that we do that, he says, whatever you do in word or deed, so whatever you say, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. What that means practically is that if I'm living in a way that honors God, if I am conscious of God and his will as I go about my daily life, then everything I say and all that I do can be an expression of thanksgiving to God. You know, so I look at it, like my wife likes to use this phrase, she doesn't work for, you know, her company, she works for God. So a lot of days, what motivates her to do the best she can is I work for him. There's all these different places where whatever we're doing, we're recognizing I'm his representative and I'm going to do it in his name. So that's a key way that we do that. But you know me, I'm not going to let you off that easy. I want to quickly share four things that you can do to become a person who abounds in gratitude and maintains an attitude of thanksgiving. The first one is this. We can demonstrate our gratitude and thankfulness to God by faithfully coming together to worship and praise God. I mean, the Bible is full of this ex examples of this. Let me just give you a couple. If you look at Psalm 22, 22, 
I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. He's talking about, I'm going to publicly proclaim. Because remember, we learned this a while back. In Israel, there wasn't sort of this idea of silent worship and prayer. When you wanted to praise God, you did it verbally. You did it in front of other people. You wanted them to know where you stood. Now, another one, and this is, we've looked at this before prior to Thanksgiving. This is sort of a classic psalm of Thanksgiving. If you look at the 100th psalm, beginning in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. See, we demonstrate to God and our community by coming together regularly and consistently to worship him, just as you've done today, even though it's through your computer. Now, you may ask, well, who even notices your family notices, your close friends notice, your coworkers know what you do on weekends. So do our neighbors. People are aware of our activities. And see, we praise the Lord by faithfully coming together to worship him. And it's been my, you know, I've just seen this over and over. There's a blessing that comes when you say, okay, it's a little cold out now. I'd rather sleep, but hey, I'm gonna get up I'm going to go to church. Whether that, today, whether that means, okay, it just means getting out of bed, grabbing a cup of coffee, and you sit in front of your computer, it's still good. Because the idea is that you're saying, I'm going to gather with those who are there. You know, I'm going to discipline myself because I'm conscious of what God has done for me. Now, some may say, that's legalism. No, that's obedience to God's word. That's gratitude. That's an expression of thanksgiving. You know, when we're doing thing, church the way we should, we gather together to praise him and thank him for all that he's done and all that he is. That's why I'm not going to not do our Thanksgiving Eve service on Wednesday because it's my favorite time of the year when I get to hear how God has been working. I heard that a couple Saturdays ago when we gathered for a time of prayer. But I'm always excited to hear what people are thankful about and how God is working because the truth is, we have a God who is worthy and he is loving and he is powerful and holy and righteous and faithful. And we should celebrate that. We also need to give thanks recognizing that the blessings that we currently have, that didn't just happen. That's not fate. That's not a coincidence. That's not just you worked hard. We owe all those things. It goes back to him. <clears throat> Now, the second way that we demonstrate gratitude to God is through obedience. You know, obedience to his word, obedience to his will, obedience to the leading of his Holy Spirit. You know, I want you to remember something very important. The Bible teaches us that from God's perspective, obedience is better than sacrifice or giving monetary things. It's even better than praise to God because praise without obedience is meaningless. You can, sure, you can come to church, you can gather, you can sing, but if you're not really obeying God, there's no, it, it does nothing for anybody. And remember what we saw a few months back in Matthew from our own Savior's lips. He said, obedience is proof that you really love me. Therefore, Obedience is a way in which we demonstrate that we are overflowing with thanksgiving to God for all that he is and for all that he's done. Now, I will say, this one is a little bit tougher than the last one because you know what? Peer pressure can get us to attend church or the youth group or cause us to worship with those around us. But see, obedience is something that can only come from the privacy of your own heart. We can look compliant externally while inside we're rebelling. The third one, and to me, this really resonated in, in light of our current situation. And I think this one is so important for us as Christians to hear is perseverance and loyalty. What I'm talking about is hanging in there, not quitting, not getting anxious, not being worried, not giving up. You know, not just serving the Lord during the good times or when it's convenient and easy, 
And then when you get busy and pressed for time, or hey, you get, find yourself living in the middle of a pandemic, you allow your commitment to God and your gratitude to Him to decrease or stop. That is not a, a, a valid excuse. All oh, things are so bad. No, that doesn't work. I was reading one of Chuck Swindoll's books, and he was going through a time that he describes as one of those low tide experiences in his life. He was overwhelmed, he was overworked, he was tired, plus there was a lot of stuff breaking down. And he said he, one day he saw a sign hanging on a wall in a shop that said, when you're faced with a busy day, save precious time by skipping your devotions. Signed, Satan. <laughs> That's always what he's after. He wants you to be mad at God right now. He wants you to doubt God's goodness and for you know, and faithfulness. He wants, he puts, oh, you're so busy and this is, oh, I mean, you're having to homeschool, you're having to do this. There's all these reasons. I understand. By the way, I don't want to be political, but they're trying to take Christmas. Why do you think that is? What do you think, who do you think's really underneath all that? Brothers and sisters, God doesn't change during pandemics or busy, tumultuous, hard times. And neither should we. Of all times, we should be leaning more into God. And I'm proud of so many of you are doing that. But just because there's, you know, no matter what we're facing here, it still pales in comparison to what most of our brothers and sisters in this world are living through. And we're living through before a pandemic. What I'm saying is, we need to hang in there and stay focused on Christ. I mean, you can clearly see in the Bible that God places a premium on loyalty and perseverance, you know, not giving up. If you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, there's this constant refrain. He who overcomes, you know, he or she who hangs in there, come what may, they're going to be the ones wearing crowns. And... and, and and by the way, when you and I get busy or we're facing hardships and all these events and we continue to praise God and thank God, when we still gather with other Christians, when we remain obedient to God, we're making this, a profound statement that says, I believe in the Lord God and he is good. I honestly believe we've been given a, one of the greatest privileges ever at this time. There are so many opportunities we have to make the Lord visible and show the difference that knowing him makes. Fourth and finally, you know, the fourth way to demonstrate overflowing gratitude and an attitude of thanksgiving to God is to be committed, you know, is through commitment and service to the body of Christ. The church may be closed. There are still people that are here all the time helping, doing things, serving some people are out there delivering food. You're involved in a lot of things. So one way we do that is to the service of the body of Christ. But we also do that through service to people outside the body. It's looking out for people. It's trying to help them, especially those people who, and that's one of the reasons we're going to do this food drive. There's a lot of people that are hurting. There's a lot of people struggling. And, and again, we have such a wonderful opportunity to make invisible. See, what I'm saying is you need to be giving yourself your talents and your time to the Lord. You know, volunteering to help, you know, faithfully tithing, serving in the kingdom. These are just a few of the ways that you can demonstrate your gratitude to God. And again, you know, I'm not saying you do this to earn something or you're doing it because you have to. You do it because, wow, I'm saved and I, I want to give, I want to help, I want to make an impact. But bottom line, Paul says... If you truly understand what God has done and continues to do for you, then you will be overflowing with gratitude and an attitude of thanksgiving. That's just the bottom line. So let me ask you, if someone has or were to observe your life for these last few months, would they be able to see clear evidence of gratitude and thanksgiving? Would they see you praising God and, and just clinging to him and loving on him? 
You know, what I'm asking is, is your life, especially in these days, characterized by gratitude? Or is it characterized by things that seem to be more important to you right now than giving thanks to God? You know, it's been my experience that anything that overflows gets noticed. I notice when I fill my milk glass too full. We had that last year at this time. A storm drain overflowed, flooded the basement. Unfortunately, I'm sure you and I both, we've had toilets overflow. We, now we look around and we see people waiting to get into grocery stores and shops. We, a river overflowing its bank. The fact is, things that overflow get noticed. And I would just say that as those who have experienced the blessings and benefits of knowing the Lord, of knowing his presence and his faithfulness, we should be people who are so overflowing with thanksgiving that we are dripping a trail of gratitude everywhere we go. Everywhere we are, everywhere the Lord strategically places us, there's just that evidence because of all the benefits and blessings that God has brought into our lives. <clears throat> you know, I had an experience a week ago. I haven't told anybody about this. But it was really profound for me, and it's, I don't mean to take this the wrong way. Um, it was just one of those sort of God moments. He woke me, I know now it was him, he woke me up early and I was just laying in bed. Candace was sleeping soundly away. And it was almost like, I don't know if you've ever had this, but it's almost like the Lord gives you a flashback. He took me way, way back in my life to what my life was like before I knew him, the way I do now. And it was like he just let me feel for just a brief moment the anxiety, the fear, the, even though I'm very successful in the world, I mean, you know, even emotionally and in my personal life, I was, I was messing up. I was blowing it right and left. And it was like he just, first thing he helped me see was that you know, this beautiful woman laying beside me, I would have never picked her on my own. That was his doing. It was his gift. I was, I was really honest. He showed me. And I would have never been able to be stayed married for 30 years and be happy without his intervention. And just let me see. You know, I gave you this precious gift, this, this woman that I have never known anybody that I think is more committed and devout to God. This woman that has stood with me through the hard times, the good times, has been my best friend, my confidant. Every step of the way, I would have never had the wisdom and sense to pick somebody like that. I wouldn't even have known what to value, but God knew. And I just sat there and I just started thanking him for the gift of my life. But that wasn't it. Then he started taking me back event after event after event. And he just like, can you show me, see how I worked here? See how I did this? You thought this was this, but look what I did. And I found all I could do was just every time he showed me something new, I remembered it, I just started thanking him. And before I knew it, over an hour had passed. And it wasn't like, well, I got through it all in an hour. I could have gone the whole day. I probably could have gone the whole week. But it was like, it just did something. Because I was sort of a little sad and grieving Thanksgiving, maybe different and all this stuff. And it just hit me. Man, I have so much evidence. I've seen God again and again and again work. Many times without my cooperation, to be honest. But I realized I have so many things, so many people, so many situations to just be thankful for. And I owe every bit of it to him. I mean, honestly, most of the time he's done it in spite of me. He's just that good. And I just, it just struck me that, you know, let's be people who not only have as an integral part of our lives praise unto God, but a real desire to bless his holy name for all that he is and for all that he's done. This week I, was, I read two devotions that I want to share just parts of them very briefly with you in closing, but they really struck me. First was by Henry Blackaby and the other was Chuck Swindoll. Blackaby said, thankfulness is foundation to the Christian life. Thankfulness is a conscious response that comes from looking beyond 
our circumstances and blessings to their source. As Christians, we have been forgiven, saved from death, and adopted as God's children. There could be no better reason for a grateful heart. And then uh, Chuck Swindoll says, Our God not only struck the spark that gave you and me life, he continues to prompt each heartbeat in every chest, every second of every minute. And what he does for us as individuals, he does for the vast universe around us. Furthermore, what God creates, God sustains. Not only does he number the hairs on our heads, he determines the days of our lives. In doing so, he weaves everything together into his design. Ultimately, the tapestry of his handiwork will be something beautiful to behold. So take heart. God is in full control. Nothing is happening on the earth that brings a surprise to heaven. Nothing touches us that is not first passed through the fingers of his hands. Nothing is outside the scope of his divine radar screen as he guides us safely home. Lord, I thank you for being our God. More than, Lord, you're not just God, you're a good God. Lord, and I am confident that if we were to just approach you honestly and openly, we would be able to see that the things we treasure most, the things that really matter, have all come from you. And Lord, it doesn't matter if we're in the midst of a lockdown or things are tough here or there, Lord, you don't change. You're faithful, you're good. And you have assured us again and again that you are with us, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. Lord, give us a good sense to just lean into you, to cling to you. But more than that, Lord, cultivate a spirit of gratefulness in our hearts. May we be people that have eyes to see who you are, what you're doing, and then a desire to thank you, as Paul said, with everything within us. Lord, may we be lovers of you. May we be people that our lives are just characterized by gratitude, that we're not caught up in circumstantial things, Lord, but that we are just building our lives on the rock. Lord, I thank you that you are our sure foundation. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
go in his great faithfulness today, walking with him, trusting in him, listening to him, giving him thanks in all things. Join us for youth and adult Sunday school online. And then come back, join us on Wednesday for our Thanksgiving Eve service. You can click on our website to find out how to join us. God bless and have an amazing week in heaven.